I'm Andrew Hilton. My job is that I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation in London. Uh, the CSFI is doing a series of videos with the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And we, the theme of these videos is financial, is financial sustainability. This video, this particular video, is looking at what fintech can do for sustainability. And I think this is really an important area. It's a sort of very cutting edge area. And we put together a terrific team uh, with a kickoff speaker will be Chris McHugh. Chris is the uh, LIBF's lecturer and director of the Center for Sustainable Finance. He's also a visiting lecturer at the Judge School in Cambridge and a former managing director at HSBC. So he kind of covers both banking and sustainable finance. Second will be, I think, um, Olivier Ma uh, Oliver Marchand, who is the global head of ESG research and development at MSCI in Zurich, but I think better known as the former CEO and co-founder of Carbon Delta. Uh, which at the time was the most comprehensive climate and market data platform in the world, uh, subsequently absorbed into MSCI. He has a PhD in computer science from ETH in Zurich. And then uh, Martina McPherson, uh, who is the executive, well, senior VP uh, for strategic ESG engagement at Moody's. Um, she is uh, at the pro, uh, also the president of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets. She's an advisory board member of the European Law Institute, a guest lecturer on sustainable finance at all sorts of places, Henley and the University of Zurich. And she is originally German with an MA from Go the Goethe Institute, uh, formerly head of ESG and index products at S&P Dow Jones and at MSCI. And then uh, batting cleanup, as it were, Vincent Gilles, Chief Investment Officer at Climate. Climate Invest, an investment platform focusing on clean energy, clean tech, clean this, clean that. Also a member of the uh, Investment Committee at Aquo Co-op and an advisor to H2GO Power, a startup mentor at Imperial College and so on and so forth, a former managing director at, uh, Credit, at uh, Credit Suisse. Um, my colleague has uh, submitted, a, well, offered a list of potential questions to uh, our panel members. I'll just, they, they set a little bit of a framework. How can fintech actually drive improvement in sustainable outcomes? And what is sustainable fin fintech? How can sustainable finance embed fintech within it? Uh, and does the UK have any competitive advantage or are there other centers notably perhaps Singapore that are ahead of us in this. There's been a lot of work in this area, going back, I guess, to the banking, uh, the BEI, the Banking Environment Initiative of 2017. The Swiss now have a sustainable fintech initiative. Um, and I noticed that Cambridge, the Cambridge uh, Institute for Sustainability Leadership, set up something called Trado, which is a consortium of banks uh, designed to produce a blockchain enabled sustainable supply chain. Well, if it's blockchain enabled, good luck to you. Uh, there's a lot going on in this area. Let me ask, first of all, Chris, who also has links back, as I say, with Cambridge, uh, just to give us a sort of 35,000 feet view of sustainable finance and fintech. Chris McHugh. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so just a few thoughts around two different ways of looking at fintech and how it relates to sustainable finance. There's, there's a product view. Um, there are ways perhaps that fintech uh, can reorganize and potentially replace certain products that are out there. And I think we'll hear about some of those solutions later. Um, there's also equally strong uh, area of trying to find ways to fold um, sustainability concepts to facilitate what banks and investors are already, already doing. And I think what they, they both have in common is uh, really new forms of data, um, different ways of getting that data and trying to find ways to integrate it into what already is is happening. So um, what do I mean by new data requirements? There's actually quite a lot of academic literature that um, shows the use of alternative forms of data. So, so for example, if we're looking at a, uh, a company 
it's not just about their financials. You can also look at the way that they consume energy, the way that they work with natural capital actually could be um, a signal that gives you some idea of, of their credit worthiness as well. So I think the argument that um, you should be beginning to collect more forms of data is um, is established. And so there's a natural link as we start looking at ESG filters uh, and starting to ask companies to say more about what they're doing, folding that information into our understanding of what customers do helps us understand the risk better. I would also argue that in the world of transition, when you need to have a dialogue with clients to help them understand how to make the changes, that exchange of non-financial data is actually equally as important because it helps um, against banks uh, and investors understand what, what to communicate and what sort of conversation to have. So, so different data sources for sure. Um, in terms of fintech, I think there are tons of opportunities. Um, the sort of the, the data comes in, in various forms. You have sort of what I would call first, second and third person data. First person in the sense that uh, a company or an entity will tell you what it's doing. So it's publishing its own data. You have what a second person when you have a, a due diligence process, when you're asking the company. And there is an interesting question, certainly for investors and banks to understand what questions they should be asking and what data they should be gathering, because the conversations you might want to have today are going to be different than they what they were five years ago. And again, with a fintech mindset, how information is stored in those conversations. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of call reports sitting in PDF files uh, on, on servers and a lot of emails sitting in inboxes and actually finding that information, being able to consume it and use it uh, is hugely important. So there's definitely opportunities in that space. Um, we have structured and unstructured data. So you could be collecting uh, numerical information on a company, but also um, if you like, when pub people publish their ESG reports or they talk about what they're doing in sustainability, again, to be able to consume that information and do something useful with it. So new forms of information, uh, new ways to gather it and store it. And then also in terms of processing that information, um, there are, for example, in, in terms of aggregation, I think just last week there was a report from the World Bank and the World Wildlife Fund looking at ways of aggregating uh, external data sets on climate with physical locations of assets and synthesizing all that information to provide um, new insights into to what to do with technology and how to actually embed that into the financial process. So from a, from a fintech perspective, I think there are um, uh, tons of opportunities both in the product space to gather all this new data, actually organize it in a better way and be able to communicate that in a clearer way for clients, perhaps as, as investors, but also to facilitate the transition in the financial system through business as usual, whether that's through lending or uh, equity and debt investment, private and public markets, uh, to sort of facilitate that and, and clean up the, the information flow and provide the visibility that's been, been lacking. So I think there's a huge opportunity for me, and I think there's actually an extremely clear link between uh, sustainability, finance, and fintech. I think it's a it's a very uh, sort of harmonious marriage that could be. You you actually raised a couple of things. I mean, geo, uh, what's the word? Geo data, oh, uh, biotics, all sorts of things, <laughs> yeah. all sorts of new things that are happening out there in the field of alternative data. Just expand on the, them a little bit, would you? Yeah, so, so um, a phrase you may be familiar with or not, spatial finance. This is something that's uh, what the World Bank and the WWF wrote about. And this effectively is this idea that we have satellite, satellites circling the Earth, picking up data, um, for example, on cloud patterns, on weather, on um, water levels, etc., and producing these huge data sets of very, very granular information to, to sort of a range of a few meters of being able to identify what is happening. So there is a there is a product, something uh, not, not sort of promoted above others, but Geobotanics is a product where what they do is they take satellite images, they use AI to uh, eliminate fuzziness from cloud cover, etc. And it can be used to uh, measure crop success and failure at a field level. So if you can start to aggregate um, properties you can start to form early views. So timing is one of the big differences. You can't wait a year for an ESG report. If you could actually get it um, real time or, or within a week delay or something, you get better information. 
there is always a however. Um, I had a wonderful quote, quote the other day, it's not all about the farm, it's also about the farmer. So you're never going to lose that, that personal touch or the need to actually engage with the client and, and talk to them about what they're doing. But you have these, these, these global data sets that you can draw on um, to, to precisely, um, I suppose, synthesize information in a way you never could before. Again, another example, I think if, if, you, um, if you had, a, again, agriculture, you have a, a client with a farm, if you know the postcode of your client where their house is in the farmhouse, that's not very helpful in understanding the risks to that business. So, so when we talk about what kind of data banks and investors store, just having the registered office is not enough. You then have to get into this taxonomy of understanding where the physical assets are um, and how to sort of aggregate that information to really understand the, the effects on a particular business. So these, these sort of, it's a marriage between um, huge new data sets um, that are third party so we're not actually asking the customer we're looking from the outside and then combining that with extra information we've got about the physical location of assets and and blending these two things together to sort of form new views on the sort of the the risk environment okay that's great um let me turn to oliver to olivier marchand i mean this a lot of this kind of real-time data or alternative data was the kind of data that um that Carbon Delta was very much associated with. Well, how do you see fintech and sustainability, um, given that you, you, you've been involved in this, I think, for longer than pretty much anyone else? Well, I can probably explain uh, very early on when we started Carbon Delta. Um, I think uh, of the first seven employees um, at Carbon Delta, five had a PhD in computer science. Um, you know, we felt like they the just couldn't get a real job in those days. Yeah, yeah. That's very hard to get a job these days with a PhD in computer science. <laughs> so uh, we thought we have to start our own company. Um, well, jokes aside, uh, well, we made a calculation and the calculation sort of goes like this. Um, MSCI now offers 700 different metrics um, just related to clients for about 9,000 issuers. And, you know, I'm not saying all of these metrics make total sense and are are totally uh, um, usable for everyone and have 100% coverage. But if you make a simple calculation and the calculation is how many metrics are those, those are about 6 million metrics. And if you, you know, I call it the old financial research model. If you just spend, you know, money on hiring analysts, researching these um, values um, to, to uh, collect, six million values if you just spent one minute each each value it would take you 11 years to get your full universe together or 11 people one year you know you you can make the math um it's probably going to take you much more than just um just one minute to research each of them so basically to uh create a startup company that would somehow be in, in some kind of way um, ready for the task of providing any kind of sensible coverage, like a broad equity index, was uh, seemed like an impossible task for us. So that's why, you know, we felt like the the, the whole time issue was a good reason to um, to start this. But there's a totally different aspect that I think is almost more important, and that is um, with the TCFD recommendations, the task force on climate related financial disclosures, the aspect of materiality comes into the whole thinking. I think it's the emergence of, let's say, ESG as in let's do good and ESG as in it's becoming a new material risk is now converging. And, you know, the typical models you employ when you do this kind of materiality um, uh, uh, analysis are, you know, dividend discount models, they're Merton models, they're probability of default um, calculations. They're very different from uh, let's just build a score and find out, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, what is the best toaster or, you know, uh, home appliance kind of analysis. And so, so that's, that, that's where that comes into play. Materiality is, is a big driver for this whole fintech uh, mechanism. 
And I think then there's a third element and it, it can be traced back maybe to basic economic theory. And that is that, you know, we always try to uh, improve and perfectionize markets. It's just very normal. We have new data sources and those come in and uh, Chris mentioned, you know, uh, satellite data. Um, you know, we have other data as well. We have patent data. We have uh, container shipping data. We have near time uh, um, estimates for revenue. You know, we have emissions data. We have, have there are so many data sources now today. It's, it's a major task by itself to keep track of all of the emerging data sources and trying to, you know, connect them that 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 by itself is a is a computer task it's not a it's not a manual task so you know i see these three elements time materiality and and new data sources coming up why um it's actually it's not only better um to use fintech technology to do it it's not possible without mm -hmm. it's become an imperative it's you have to do it on a computer today with you know programming languages like Python and databases, there is absolutely no other way. That sort of scares me because you're going to have even more data as the internet of things becomes more ubiquitous. I mean, the data, the piles of data that are coming in, everybody is saying, you know, data is the new oil, data is this, that, and the other, but you're gonna have so much data. How the hell are you going to be able to manage it at some stage? Where is the judgment? I mean, is there going to be judgment or is this just going to be automated and a huge, huge in volumes of data that we can't even conceive of at the present time? Yeah, it's a, it's a, funny, uh, it's a funny effect that you're uh, mentioning. On the one hand, the data is exploding. On the other hand, some very basic data we still need. We still don't really have it. It's, it's a funny... Uh, sort of a dilemma is the wrong word, but it's, just a, fun, it's a funny, uh, you know, a coexistence of, of factors um, that, that always surprises me as well. Well, I think there's a typical market mechanism, right? People, you know, when something new comes up, uh, uh, you know, there's a whole hype cycle around a certain type of data, then people try it out, they find out, oh, it's only, you know, useful for 20% of the cases that we hope for, and then some data sources uh, prevail, I guess, and, and get used. Um, uh, it's 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 a normal process. I, I don't know exactly where it's going, but in a way, I think um, the whole um, transparency uh, movement and the you know the you know being much more clear about um, uh, certain aspects like you know business models, uh, pollution of business activities. Um, I, I I'm very in favor of that and. What, what I like the best about this whole um, uh, process is that I think we're moving into a space where we don't have to wait for companies to disclose what they're doing, but we have a lot of models that estimate, estimate what they're doing, maybe even better than some companies. So yeah. the companies are actually in the defense and they, they um, at least have to verify um, and and confirm or maybe not confirm and correct um, some of the data that's out there. But definitely with climate change being, you know, uh, an extremely pressing topic, we can't wait decades for companies to come up with the best global system that everybody hears to for um, disclosure. Okay, how is uh, MSCI incorporating this kind of data now? Because, I mean, you bringing carbon delta into MSCI was a win for MSCI as well in terms of new data sources. What is it doing with the, 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 the new capability that you bring in? Um, well, I mean, we're just uh, enhancing our uh, product range related to uh, climate products, and we're applying the value at risk concept, which, which goes back to this materiality that I worked really earlier. well let me tell you at the time of the great financial crisis yes yes um, i mean uh, climate bay at risk to be honest um it is uh it, we chose the name because what we wanted to express was that um it's really a risk management score rather than uh, you know another environmental score and so um we chose that name but it's actually not 
the same statistical basis as classical climate based risk, but it's more like I think a, a proper, you know, technical term would be climate potential climate mispricing uh, would maybe be a, a proper term, but that would be very not sexy to sell. So uh, we, we chose the, uh, um, you know, the, the more interesting term. I think anything would be better than calling it VAR, which has terrific history within financial services, not much of which is particularly encouraging. But uh, yeah. that's uh, Martina, what's, um, what's, what's your view of all of this? And what's Moody's view, Martina McPherson? Sure. I mean, when we look at the implications for AI, fintech, ESG and data, we should just look at the growth trajectories, the context that Oliver and others have mentioned earlier for actually this phenomena around big and unstructured data and the potential that it brings to be triaged um, with existing information that has inherent biases because it's, for instance, self-disclosed, annualized, slash not real time, and comes from different types of sources. So there's a lack of clarity, comparability and consistency uh, that comes with that particular process. Um, and there are multiple biases. I will touch on this very briefly, including the materiality definition question that also Oliver highlighted that really come to play here. Um, so ultimately, the growth trajectory for ESG data and IP is significant in size and scale. We might have all seen the OPMAS studies that have come out that actually estimate that the ESG data market was around 617 million US dollars in 2019 and is estimated to reach around 1 billion US dollars by 2021. And that's, that's obviously that for- that all? I would have thought <laughs> 1 trillion by then. No? Well, it is for the ESG data and IP. I mean, clearly there are other figures out there. UBS estimated it to become in the next few years, even something like 5 billion. That is still small in scale. But if you look at the overall size of the market and the growth trajectory, when and where we started in the few millions of revenues just maybe a decade ago, this is a trajectory of growth. So you see that that's literally why now where we're increasingly looking at uh, how we can increase further momentum, scope and scale. And that's exactly the question. Data providers are multiplying their data sources and that's literally enabled through technology. And this is exactly what we highlighted in the previous discussions. You know, we need to look at the this, this sheer coverage universes, the um, the uh, type of information, um, the type of sources of information and the way we are connecting and aligning the dots and harmonizing information also in line with existing standards and frameworks, which are um, at, at, there's a plurality of these standards and frameworks. When we look at reporting standards alone, not to mention yet the accounting frameworks that are coming um, to play. And that means literally there are now five key developments and so-called drivers for ESG data and AI fintech in that context that actually creates harmonization. I think one of the other speakers highlighted that as well. And that is very much in the context of 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution, you know, which is a fusion of advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, the internet of things, as you highlighted, 3D printing, genetic engineering, and quantum computing, and other technologies. And the digital transformation is really at the 4IR's core and trusted governance, data, and information frameworks have a key role to play. And that is closely aligned with the other phenomena that we are seeing, and that is investment, ESG investment, demand for passive and factor-led strategies. And that demand is also accelerating. You know, we are looking at the ESG investment market in Europe alone. It stands now in Q3 2020 at around 1 trillion US dollars. Again, a similar um, size when a uh, similar momentum and, and scope and size when you look at the trajectory when and where investments have grown in this area also particularly over the last decade and um, that means that data complexity management is part of this journey towards on the one hand alignment but also better systemic we call it ESG risk and opportunities management and ultimately it was estimated by Findex table that by 2022, 60% of global GDP will be digitized. And that means growth in every industry is driven by digitally enhanced offerings, operations and relationships. And ESG very much is at the core of this intangible journey and the room for digitization slash growth, the trajectory of growth is ultimately enormous. Um, and lastly, um, that means AI FinTech 
and ESG have multiple implications for investors in capital markets. You know, that means they can be seen as strategic enablers in the context of 4IR, in the context of data complexity management, but also in the context of the growth of sustainable investment strategies alongside the trajectory of passive investing and factor-led strategies that are around these quantitative rule-based approaches that require the relevant insights, data points being mapped and matched against existing frameworks. And last but not least, that brings me to the point, you know, we see still prevailing challenges with this sphere, given that there is such a pluralism and a multitude of frameworks and definitions. And uh, just to highlight a couple of them, there's the definition around materiality. Are we talking about financial materiality? Are we talking about dual materiality? Are we talking about dynamic materiality? An increasingly new concept that looks at the context when and where ESG issues are making a landfall and how they're being managed by organizations and ultimately across the stakeholder management spectrum. Mm -hmm. The alignment of standards and standardization of information in our sphere that I highlighted the comparability of this information. And then last but not least, the gaps. We talked about real-time information gaps. We also need to look at forward-looking perspectives, especially in the context of climate risk scenarios and the different type of time horizons implied. And again, human capabilities will not be sufficient in giving us these insights, triaging the information and providing us with the relevant scenarios at play. And this is again, again, exactly the rationale for fintech and AI enabled data and information tools. Yeah, I have to say it sounds terrifying to me. Uh, but the one thing that I take away from what you're saying that I want to emphasize is this data capacity management, because uh, Oliver was making much the same point. I mean, you're, there is just so much data out there, and there's going to be so much more data out there, that the only way to handle it is machine learning. Is that not right? I mean, it just simply and in the particularly in the ESG area, where obviously there is increasing interest, investor interest growing exponentially, surely um, the data management problem is going to become something that, that you probably needs. MSCI or Moody's or in institutions like that are the only ones that are going to have the capability to handle it. How do you see that? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at, for instance, when and where still conundrums persist um, because there's not sufficient access and availability of information to specific data points. We talked about satellite imagery, and that's the technology we're using for 427's physical climate risk assessments. When you're looking at when and where markets are concerned, where access to information is inherently different and dif difficult to, to, to achieve, uh, look at, for instance, China and uh, emerging markets, uh, small to medium-sized country coverage, and the areas when and where we just do not have yet the sufficient insights, slash there is also potentially a size or jurisdictional bias when and where and how information can really be disclosed from certain operations or companies with operations in these jurisdictions. That's again where um, obviously AI and fintech sourcing platforms that can also provide means for disclosure for these corporations for input can ultimately help to gain that access and just to highlight, I mean, Moody's most recently made a minority stake investment into Miotech. This is a, a, another key example when and where and how we try to gain access to more information, also supply chain related information and data in markets, in this case, China, when and where it's increasingly difficult to gain the relevant access. And now this means we can look at ESG data, KYC, that's know your customer information, and uh, looking at aligning the data inputs coming from financial information sources with ultimately non-financial information sources when and where um, markets such as China are concerned. And, and this is an increasingly new area. And uh, we have seen other players moving into the sphere as well uh, in order to increase coverage in developed, but especially in emerging markets, you are increasingly reliant upon the relevant technology. Well, I would think actually satellite data on China is probably better than Xi Jinping is actually getting in his daily briefing. You probably know more than he does about what's going on in the Chinese economy. You, re you mentioned four things. You mentioned taxonomy. You mentioned the absence of agreed taxonomies, materiality, which is obviously a big issue, uh, particularly as you get so much data in that you can't weigh it all equally, standards, 
which we don't do or don't have with competing standards at the present time, and obviously comparability. Can I ask uh, our fourth, fourth, fourth speaker, uh, from, um, uh, Vincent Gilles, um, how, at, at, at Climate Climb Eight Invest? How can you use all this data? Is uh, it useful, or are you just swamped by it? God, you, could you read my little notes when someone else was talking? There was, okay. uh, the big word is overburden, <laughs> essentially what I wanted to report on. Now, look, it, it's interesting. I mean, first, as, as a side comment, so we, we started, we went straight into the discussion without defining sustainability, which illustrates one of the issues we have today, which is tons of data is now attached to the ESG, sustainability, whatever a theme, and not all of it is relevant and not all of it is of the right quality. I'll come back to this. Um, but you certainly alluded to something very, very important, which is we are currently trying to calculate something which is fairly complex, which is the impact of our portfolios. And as soon as you send a couple of emails, you have a number of people coming to you and offering their service. And obviously, you try to understand how they come to these different numbers. Some people give you really big numbers. Some people just give you a holistic, this modern world um, approach. But then you try to tend to be a bit more analytical. And that's my background. And try to really understand how they come to those numbers. And then you realize, first, lack of standards. No one talks about the same thing using the same words, which is a bit of an issue. And the second thing is very basic stuff. If you talk about scope one, two, three, and it's not even going to four, well, on the same company, you would have four data providers, you would have four sets of data. So it does make life a bit difficult for people like me, because I actually need to be sure that the, 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 the data or the numbers I'm going to use uh, are consistent over a long period of time. The value of this data is not what it tells me for today. It's what it will tell me over a period of 20 years, and I can tell my people and my, my customers that you know we are producing or we are creating a portfolio for you that is aligned with 1.5 Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees, and I have sufficient data of the sufficient quality and clear definition to tell me that we are going there. So there's certainly an issue for me of... I went through the phase of enthusiasm for the amount of data I could be thrown <laughs> to or at. And uh, now I'm going through the phase of skepticism about it's a bit too much and actually not all of it is very useful. So that's point number one, I'd say. Point number two is um, it's actually brilliant. That's the opposite view because I did 28 years of research in different jobs and buy, buy, buy side and sell side in, in banking and fund management. And when I started, we were lacking data. The data we had looked serious and of the right quality, but because it was coming from big names, but we couldn't actually cross-check the data. And, and I think two or three of you mentioned the fact that you can fairly easily now, I mean, basically hold the feet of the companies to fire and just say, you talk about your emissions being down by X and actually we can cross-check and cross-reference all the data you give me. And that's not true. And even better, even more granular, I was talking to a food uh, fund yesterday and, and see how they now control the moisture in some parts of the world. So you have the satellite and then you've got the moisture data and therefore you can properly, properly anticipate actually the risk and therefore you can price much more effectively. And that is proper progress. That's ex extraordinarily useful for a fund manager like me. And it's probably something that you are going to pay for in the future because there's one thing we didn't really talk about so far is the value of data. It was all underlying in what everybody was saying. But the truth is, a lot of data has got a lot of value today, a lot more than probably in the past. The other thing I would say is um, the fintech is another word we could spend an hour defining, and each of us will have a completely different definition of fintech. But one of the beauties of fintech today, it has opened a full new market. Why? If you talk to my kids, I've got three kids, 20, 22, and 25. Please don't ask me exactly what they, how old they are, but anyway, it's about in this range. And, um, and, and basically, I'm a bit like Boris Johnson, but I know how many I've got. That's the difference. <laughs> but, um, and it's very interesting the way they actually use banking, use investment. I mean, they're all actually fairly active investors. 
they very enthusiastically use platforms. They tend to trust the product they are being given. They tend to ask few questions, but when they ask the questions, they actually want the answer. And it's a very different relationship from a fund management point of view because we used to be in a position of authority. And therefore, what we would say is, I'm giving you the truth. You're happy, you're not happy, it doesn't matter. This is the truth. Thank you very much. Come back in a quarter. Now, you realize that actually people will not ask you questions, but when they ask you a question, you need to get the answer. And this is why you need your data to be absolutely correct, available, and also something important, comprehensible to the people you're going to give it to. Because it's one of the things that we haven't talked about here, and it's absolutely key in fintech. We all tend here to be used to using, let's call it complex data. But we are going through a whole process of, I wouldn't call it dumping down because it's, it's, it's not a nice word. It's just making it accessible to people who are not specialists. Talking to scope one, two, and three sounds very, very smart. It's incredibly boring in society, but it sounds very smart. But the truth is no one knows what it is. But if you tell people, you gave me 100 pounds, and this means that through your 100 pounds, I'm going to take one car off the road, which is the oversimplification at, at its worst. But on the other hand, you do know what you're actually doing. And therefore, you need the data. You need to be able to calculate what you want to achieve. And then you need to be able to communicate. And that's a very important aspect here. Um, and the other point I would make, which no one mentioned, that was pretty hard to find points no one had mentioned after 25 minutes anyway, but there was crowdfunding. And I think one of the big, big things about uh, fintech today is the fact that we discovered recently that people can invest without having to go paying enormous fees. And we have a bit of a debate here with, without really having it, by the way, is we know there's a lot of value in data. We are consuming a lot more data than we used to consume. But actually, we can charge customers lower fees. And, and as, as we were talking, I had a report from one of the data providers, which is the uh, yearly report on how fees have gone down and I couldn't help but read the headline and they were talking about 15 basis points less on average versus last year. So essentially the data providers on this panel will ask me to pay more but my customers are going to ask me to pay less which actually puts me in an interesting position of I'm going to have to be a lot more a lot more clever probably is the best word in terms of the data I'm going to use how I'm going to use it and what data I'm going to pay for and what data I'm going to be able to extract freely. And that's the last point, and I mentioned quality of data. Um, there is actually quite a lot of data you can get easily now, which may not be of the right quality, but it is sufficient to be doing your job as a fund manager. So there are a lot of things which I was, I was trying to gather a bit here and listening to all of you, but I think what is important here is the availability of data in the 30 years I've been working in finance has been tremendously changed. It is now actually easy to get data. I think the, you've made a number of really important points. One, obviously, fees are being squeezed in the investment management industry and the cost of data from your data bill, as it were, is going up. You'll have to sell one of your yachts. What else can one say? But can I ask, uh, you also talk about comprehensibility, um, accessibility, and the ability to communicate and also the quality of the data. I mean, these are really important issues. Let me ask Oliver first to respond to, uh, to what, you've, what you've heard in particular from, from Vasil. Well, um, I, I do agree that there's a lot of data out there. Um, I think data quality uh, management is, I would probably think that maybe one third of my job is actually data quality management. And I think there are, you know, very varying degrees of, um, verification that you can actually do. So maybe, uh, you know, some data you can totally verify. Then there's maybe intermediate values, like number of employees of Chinese companies. How do you check? You know, you can sort of sense check, but you can't really check. And then there are, of course, you know, values like climate value at risk or warming potential or, you know, these kind of values that we produce uh, also as let's say output metrics, if you want to call it that, where, yeah, verification is essentially impossible at this point. And it's impossible because there um, is either a, a uh, 
problem of interpretation. Um, there may be different interpretations of the, you know, values. And so it may be, uh, you know, right or wrong, depending on that interpretation. And then the other point is that um, <clears throat> every, anything that has to do with, you know, materiality, um, it's hard to backtest. So, you know, we didn't have uh, a Paris Agreement uh, 10 years ago. We didn't have this kind of, uh, you know, world conviction that um, climate change is maybe the number one issue. Um, so uh, markets probably did not react um, exactly to climate change. The data wasn't available. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to describe the uh, spectrum of quality issues and what we do to, to combat them. Um, uh, regarding the price, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's an explosion of the offering um, that, that comes with, you know, building a large team. For example, we're hiring quite a lot of people at the moment. And uh, so, I mean, we have basically something in the order of magnitude of 50 projects um, going on. So it's, it is very costly to produce these metrics. It just, you know, factually is. Hmm. Yeah. Particularly, I would guess, if you're buying satellite time and things like that, that uh, presumably um, data providers in the past have not really had to look at. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a research person. You know, I love, you know, talking about the models and all of that. But if you think about uh, commercializing ESG data, you have to think about the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. And um, that includes, for example, uh, your end users accessibility to the data, um, building great apps and uh, um, uh, analytics tools uh, that enable your user to really use your data. And as you know, you know, with the typical Google, Microsoft kind of standards of um, quality of digital products, you can imagine how costly it is to produce all of these, you know, full chain uh, commercializations, I would call it. Usability of data, Martina, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, this, I think that uh, Vincent made a really good point about uh, the comprehensibility, the accessibility of the need for comprehensible data, the need for accessible data, the need for data that users can actually understand. There's so much out there. Martina. Sure, I think that brings us back to some of uh, the earlier discussions around defining um, what ESG means and classification frameworks, definitions for the different type of ESG metrics um, slash criteria slash categories that are out there and um, how you actually then constitute um, a, re a rating and a score. And that brings me to a point which is um, probably one of the prevailing issues and linked to the usability and that's the question around divergence. Um, there is a clear divergence uh, when and where ESG research and ratings are concerned. You might have all read the MIT Sloan study from 2019 that talks about that ESG ratings um, are on average correlated at around 61% and credit ratings are correlated, for instance, between Standard and Poor's and Moody's at around 99%. Um, and that actually is um, a, a challenge when and where comparability between the different type of ESG research and ratings methodologies is concerned. Um, and that is mainly down to scope weight and measurement divergence. Um, but the, the other discussion that comes up here and that I've participated in quite frequently is increasingly investors are actually buying raw data points. They are creating their own scoring methodologies um, and mechanisms to actually dive deeper into the key issues and themes that they are concerned with and about. And that means um, if we are looking at divergence in and between different research and ratings approaches, which is inherent because the IP and methodologies are different, that the sources very often even differ. You know, it is quite interesting to compare a CSR report versus an integrated report being issued by the same organization, but fundamentally including um, different type of data points. Uh, and that it is even accelerated further if you're looking at then triaging or looking at comparing data and triaging data when and where third party information sources such as NGO reports are concerned. But that means at the end of the day, it's the investment decision maker at the other end 
who should have a clear investment philosophy and process in place to then understand the type of information the organization is looking for to be included in an investment decision-making process that actually meets the need, the scope and the scale of, of the assessment process. And hence, you know, I think not one size fits all. There is a, a, a good array of data and a good array of differences out there that actually serve these different and very varying needs. And I think uh, um, Oliver uh, and, and someone else made a very important point of saying we are not just also looking even at the same type of ESG definitions here. More broadly, we need to look at ESG and beyond that into impact. And there are increasingly new methodologies out there also that have been put into the domain, for instance, by the World Economic Forum and the Big Four around stakeholder metrics and the broader sphere of impact assessment metrics that actually can give a broader insight in what type of outcomes we aim to achieve and we want to look for. And again, the data points are an input and they ultimately can lead to some conclusions at the output end. But the decision-making process is ultimately on the investor side. And I, well, that, that, Vincent was nodding his head when you were talking about you know, the, um, the data actually being individual users building their own indices effectively from the data right. that is being provided. Can I ask Vincent to talk about that? And also, I mean, can you, you, nobody can be surprised that, uh, that there's great divergence between ESG raters at the present time, far more than uh, conventional credit raters. I mean, it's a much newer industry. Uh, I assume that let's say in the in the days of Fitch and Dun and Bradstreet and so on and so forth, and you when you had a lot of credit rating agencies out there, there was wide divergence. In fact, I seem to remember that one of them was known for always giving better ratings than the others. If you were really desperate, you would go to one. Um, that it hasn't yet matured as an industry. But can can I ask you what what your view on that, Vincent, is? Well, there's, there's a massive difference here, which is uh, you would get a credit rating paying for it, and companies don't pay for an ESG rating. That's a massive difference. Uh, I'm not going to get into the debate on some form of influence that they may have had on uh, the credit rating levels just prior to the 2008 crisis. Uh, otherwise, we would be here until Christmas probably. But the truth is, it's just a perverse system. ESG, from that point of view, is better because it's actually people like me paying for it. The problem is when you ask for ESG and stating the blindingly obvious is you're asking for nothing because it doesn't mean anything. So definitions are still in the making. And you start having a pretty clear view of the E side. So on the E side, we spend 90% of the time looking at carbon or GHG because it's easy, it's quantifiable, we do understand what it is, despite the fact we can't see it. And there is tremendous amount of data available, so it's easy for us. We can communicate on carbon. Communicate on other pollutants, slightly more complex, and the data is not there, or the data is not entirely reliable. And I mentioned something which is very, very important for me, is the fact that you need long-term data series. I don't really care about one or two years, to be frank with you. I mean, it doesn't mean anything for me, which is a problem because we're talking here about getting to step change and, and reducing pollution. So I need proper data in the long term, and I then need to anticipate or just, just to for, forecast what, what, what the future data will be. There's another thing which, which is very important here is, is the, I don't think we, we really talked about it, but it's the misuse of data. I mean, I give you a perfect example, and I'm going to be on purpose slightly controversial here. In the last three years, every year you have a report saying that companies that have more women at the board level outperform in the market. Beautiful headline. No one ever asked the question, uh, is this the stock outperforming? Is it from an industrial point of view they're outperforming? Or is it from a financial point of view they're outperforming? And the other thing which is absolutely fascinating is how can you encourage a long-term trend such as reduction of emissions and then say over one year, it's, it's, I mean, we know it's, it's, it's a complete coincidence where but you know that over 20 years, boards that have been more international, more diverse, actually were better boards. So I think you, you mentioned it at some stage, and it's always one of the things where you, you look at it and you say, I can't really say it publicly, which I just did. But, but the truth is that some of this data is just there, but it's not 
quality data and it's useless. It's basically useless because we all feel actually how to use it. So I think that's that that's that's probably what I would say here. But I think, Martina, you, you made a very important point. So I nodded twice when you talked. And the first nod was actually when you said people are buying raw data and are trying to develop their own index or metrics or whatever. You're absolutely right. I mean, to, to tell you exactly where we are now at Climate in terms of impact calculation, we talk to data providers. They would give us basically a finished product and then we would put a stamp on it. Or we are actually considering buying the raw data and you've got a perfect raw data source, which is CDP, everybody's using it and then have my own system and really spend time thinking about it. One of the issues there is the time available and the resources for fund managers. So what you start seeing now is, and we've managed to talk about ESG for 53 minutes without the word greenwashing. So I thought someone had to say that. Um, look at how many people work in the big organizations. Um, you talk to the BlackRock or the Fidelity of this world, extremely competent people. I mean, there's absolutely not the point I want to make. What I want to make as a point is they've managed to actually redirect a lot of resources into actually this particular area and using data. Then they've got a problem, they're legacy assets, and they try to make them look greener than probably are. But that's not, that's, that's not the point. Then you've got a whole range of new asset managers like us. Um, people are just trying to say, how can we use this data efficiently? And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I need to come back to this, but data is expensive. And the more complex the data, the more expensive it is. And one thing that you haven't mentioned, which is very important from an asset manager point of view, is the ownership of data. If I buy data of MSCI and I decide I'm not happy after five years, unfortunately, it's Oliver's data, it's not mine. And I need to start from scratch. And that is actually one of the reasons what Martina was absolutely correct, is we all look at buying simple raw data and start developing our own product. But it's the infancy of the problem, to be frank with you. I mean, I'm, I sit down with four or five friends doing the same job, and we all have exactly the same issue, and we all slightly reluctant to go to Oliver, not because it's Oliver, but because it's a big company and they've got more power. And we quite like the idea of developing our product. But then again, you put five guys around the table, they have five views on what should be the definition and what should be achieved. And that's the big issue here. I think I better give Oliver a chance to respond to that. Uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Chris if he'll um, take, tell me what his takeaways from what he's heard are. But Oliver first. Well, first of all, I want to say that um, uh, we have the, those same kind of discussions. I mean, it's not like, um, you know, internally at MSCI and I'm sure at all other firms, uh, Matina probably has very similar discussions, you know. It's, it's a difficult space and, uh, you know, there can be different objectives, different ways to measure it. And um, I mean, that's basically, you know, what I spent most of my day with, you know, discussing with people, should we do it this way or that way? Or, you know, what's, what's the optimal way? Um, the second thing, um, I, I totally agree that the data is more on the expensive side. Um, the <laughs> MSCI quarterly review is available for everyone to, um, um, to look at. Um, it's, it's all, you know, publicly disclosed, but it's still in an investment area. So you're not, we're not trying to, um, let's say, uh, milk the market in any kind of way, but I mean, it's basically a, a big, huge investment. Um, so, uh, and that comes just, you know, with the fact that everything is so complex and it, it takes a lot of people. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm having more of a trouble telling my team, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, because it just, it's becoming too much um, to jump on all of these projects because, you know, there's a time cost quality triangle that we're just sort of restricted to and that we need to live in. Um, but uh, yeah, point taken, uh, Vasa, I, uh, I understand. And, and I do want to echo uh, Martina's um, view that people are buying uh, base data. I think the um, let's say, for example, the um, MSCI uh, um, ratings, uh, the ESG ratings, I think uh, only a small portion of the clients are using them, you know, just one by one. It's actually the underlying data that uh, the clients are, are using. And, and I think that's great. I mean, we, we oftentimes learn from that as well. 
Chris, what's your takeaway from all of that? Well, first of all, so a tremendous number of interesting salient points. So I've, I've hope we could do them justice. I, I think the, um, you know, I think it's really interesting this comparing credit models to to ESG models. I think, you know, we have we have maths with credit, so we can understand where the credit rating comes from a bit better. I think when it's hard with ESG, uh, if somebody says to you, why do you make that investment or what's your value system for ESG? So we talked about some of the inconsistencies is much harder to do. Maybe the light at the end of the tunnel is if, if we believe in the sort of the net zeros in 2050 that we're on a particular trajectory, maybe we'll figure out and maybe it'll take five years to do so, but we need to be on a particular glide path and maybe the information we need to do that will become clearer and then we won't have to gather all the data. We can start to settle down and say, I know what I need now. I know the information I need. I think there's two big holes in, in the whole world of fintech that if someone can solve them, maybe they'll they'll make their fortune and they're not, they're not new problems. One of them is um, proper understanding of ownership of assets and, and some sort of taxonomy is really hard to do. And the second is supply chains, which I think Oliver might have mentioned that. I think that's that's a incredibly hard, but it might be what we need to try and get some visibility on if we need to understand how that trajectory is going to work over the next 30 years. Um, but yeah, and maybe that's my hope is sort of once the problem statement becomes much clearer, we understand what the, the trajectory should be for these portfolios, then we know what data we really need to, to make to make it happen. I think this issue of the ownership of assets is uh, something that I hadn't really thought about, but it is really important. Um, and the taxonomy comes up every time we have a discussion of ESG taxonomy, taxonomy, taxonomy. It's a word I'd never heard until I dip my toe into the ESG waters and now it's, uh, I'm in it up to the eyeballs. Uh, can I thank all of you for, I, I think we've run over, I apologize for that, but can I thank all of you for, uh, one of the most stimulating discussions that I've, I've been involved in for a very long time. For, thank you, Martina. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. And of course, thank you to Chris McHugh and to his friends at LIBF. And thank you all for watching. Many thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.